The path of the salmon has coursed the lower Snake River for more than 10,000 years, shaping the culture of its peoples. The salmon's wondrous and mysterious journey from river to ocean and back again has brought nourishment and spiritual sustenance to lives across the landscape who thrived on their certain return. Until two centuries ago, as many as 16 million salmon returned each year to their spawning grounds in the Columbia River Basin, which includes the Snake River. It has been estimated that Native Americans harvested less than a quarter of the annual run. But in the half century after the coming of settlers, the harvest surged to nearly 90%. Commercial fishing supplied 50 canneries with ton after ton of salmon. Habitat destruction added to the toll. And early hatcheries were not very successful. By the 1890s, some stocks of salmon were already seriously depleted. Then came the dams. Before Bonneville was designed in the early 30s, little was known about the biology of salmon and steelhead. Much study and expense resulted in three fish ladders with bypass canals, successful for helping adults migrate upriver. But mortality was high for juvenile salmon trying to migrate down to the ocean. From the onset, the Army Corps of Engineers was committed to finding passage for fish. But the more scientists learned, the more complex became their task. They found that turbines can stun and sometimes kill the young salmon, that slack water slows their journey, spillways can harm them with gas supersaturation, and that reservoirs harbor their predators. So the Corps, often in conjunction with other agencies, designed a continuing series of system improvements. In 1945, when Congress authorized dams for the Lower Snake, the stretch was still wild with the rapids that challenged Lewis and Clark. Congress determined that multipurpose dams were necessary for hydropower for national defense and to open the waterway for navigation. Opposition to the dams was immediate and aggressive. There was widespread concern that these dams would add too many hurdles for Snake River fish to overcome. The controversy and a lawsuit caused a 10-year delay which meant that these dams could be designed with another decade's worth of research and improvements in fish bypass technology. Ice Harbor Dam, 1961. Lower Monumental, 1969. Little Goose, 1970. Lower Granite, 1975. Each dam was constructed with one or more ladders for adult fish. But only Lower Granite had a screen bypass system for smolts. Subsequent improvements added state-of-the-art bypass systems at all four dams. For example, to help fish bypass the turbines, Diversion screens were installed, dramatically increasing the number of juvenile fish guided away from turbines. In addition, a system of nine fish hatcheries was created to substantially increase adult salmon returns. Eventually, the hatchery steelhead return was considered a success, but not the Chinook or sockeye salmon. By the late 1970s, Tribes, fisheries agencies, and salmon advocates intended to file petitions for the most depleted runs under the Endangered Species Act. But they held off, because in 1980, the Northwest Power Planning Council was established with the directive to guarantee salmon equitable treatment with other river users. But the fish continued to disappear. Then in 1990, the Shoshone-Bannock tribe of central Idaho 
petition for a listing for the Snake River sockeye salmon. In December 1991, the National Marine Fisheries Service declared the sockeye an endangered species. The following year, Snake River's spring, summer, and fall Chinook were added as threatened. Then in 1994, they too were declared endangered. These listings triggered the National Marine Fisheries Service to put lower Snake River salmon on a recovery fast track. The Fisheries Service issued biological opinions establishing measures needed for salmon survival. They required the Corps and other federal agencies to implement many operational and structural improvements and enforced an ambitious schedule to develop and test new technologies. They also set forth, among other recommendations, the opinion of some scientists that drawing down the Lower Snakes reservoirs to free-flowing river level may be the only scenario that would result in significant salmon recovery. Since that option had never been fully researched, it was felt there was not enough information to make a thorough, responsible, unbiased recommendation. So the Corps proposed a study of three pathways to improve salmon passage to be completed by 1999. It is titled the Lower Snake River Juvenile Salmon Migration Feasibility Study. Perhaps more than any creature on Earth, salmon have extraordinarily diverse demands of water habitat. Born in freshwater, salmon eggs transform into smolts within a year. Triggered by spring snowmelt, they swim to the ocean, their bodies gradually adapting to salt water. After one to four years, adult salmon return upriver. Navigating by chemical smells they can detect to one part per trillion, they return to the place where they were spawned. Although salmon spend most of their lives in the ocean, the Corps' work to improve survival focuses on the place where it has responsibility, the river. Thus, the Corps is studying three pathways of changing lower Snake River dams to improve survival of listed juvenile salmon. The pathways include research based on engineering, biology, other science, and social and economic analysis of potential costs and benefits. Scoping for the study began with a series of public meetings in 1995. People from around the region are encouraged to participate and follow its progress. One pathway of the study is to maintain the existing systems of the dams so that the continuing uses of hydropower, navigation, and recreation would continue to operate and be maintained. Already scheduled improvements include adding to the system of trucks and barges that move migrating fish around the dams. The immediate survival rate for fish transported below Bonneville is around 98%. However, the current system only handles about half the total migrating juvenile fish. Additional barges would be added. And they might feature a system called direct loading. Moving fish directly onto barges eliminates the stress of being held in raceway ponds and may increase overall survival. Another improvement is the installation of extended length bar screens at Little Goose and Lower Granite. These new screens are twice as long as the diversion screens at Ice Harbor and Lower Monumental. They've proven to divert 60 to 90% of juvenile salmon away from the turbines. An Ice Harbor improvement is the retrofit of spillway deflectors, like those already in place at the other three dams. Flow deflectors prevent spillway water from plunging deep into the stilling basin and trapping gases. This reduces the chance for gas bubble trauma, a condition like the bends which can be fatal to fish. Another pathway of the study includes major fish passage improvements. Surface bypass collection 
is a new concept that may increase salmon survival. It takes advantage of the natural behavior of salmon to swim at or near the surface of the water. The system features open slots that fish can pass through instead of diving toward the turbine intakes. More fish would be intercepted with less delay and stress. The study is exploring different variations of the surface collector, full, partial, and hybrid versions. The collectors might divert fish to the transport system or another downstream release point. Fish guidance structures are also being tested. Placed upstream from the intake turbines, they would physically direct fish toward the surface bypass systems and away from turbines. Turbine modifications are being analyzed. The study is examining where injuries occur as fish pass through the turbines and how changes in operation and design might improve fish passage. Raising the level of stilling basins below the spillway is another major improvement option. This would decrease the gas supersaturation that causes gas bubble trauma. Another pathway of the study, based on the Corps' preliminary evaluation results, would return the lower snake to a more natural river condition. This alternative would involve lowering the water level in reservoirs and removing the earthen embankments. The 140-mile stretch would then revert to a free-flowing condition. Most of the dam structure might be left standing. A free-flowing river would speed the downriver migration of juvenile salmon and eliminate mortality from passage through the four dams and their reservoirs. As part of the feasibility study, the Corps will develop an environmental impact statement. The EIS will identify the environmental, social, cultural, and economic impacts on irrigation, fisheries, hydropower, ports, recreation, and the navigation system, and outline the Corps' recommendations for improving juvenile salmon migration in cooperation with other federal and state agencies. The Corps encourages the public to become involved in the process because diverse views and values will all be included and evaluated. Salmon have long been part of the culture and heritage of the Pacific Northwest. Based on this study, the Corps will determine a recommended alternative for juvenile salmon passage through the Lower Snake River providing Congress with the research necessary to make an informed decision to move the salmon on the path of recovery.